Welcome back. I hope you had a good discussion with your groups. We're going to be continuing now in the second session tonight to the book of 1 John. So if you want to turn in your Bibles to 1 John, that's where we will be the remainder of the evening. And we're going to start right away. I am, as you look behind me, I am not at a live audience tonight, so I'm going to try and make sure I don't talk too fast. And it's a very different dynamic speaking to a microphone and a computer screen. Even if you don't get the back and forth feedback from the group you normally sit in front of. But I, I trust that God will use this to communicate his truth uh, regardless, knowing that the audience will just hear this a little bit later. Well, let's go in. First John is the first of the letters by the Apostle John. And near the end of your Bible, it's the longest of his letters. And it is written by John the Apostle. He's, uh, towards the end of his life, he is, writes, obviously, the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and, of course, uh, the Book of Revelation. Um, you've already covered the Gospel of John and the Book of Revelation, and now we get to look at his letters. Well, Bob Utley, um, from his resources, which are on Bible.org, gives us a little bit of what do we know about John the Apostle. Well, we know that he was the son of Zebedee and Salome. And we know from the gospel, of course, that he was a fisherman on the Sea of Galilee with his brother James. And it looks like his family, um, in all likelihood, owned several boats. So they were a small business owner. They had an enterprise. They were some people of some success uh, in the fishing industry there. They had people working for them. They were not in the employ of another fishing group. They owned their own business. Uh, there are some people who believe, and you could look in John 19.25, if you're wanting to write these down. It's John 19.25 and Mark 15.20. It's possible that his mother was a sister of Mary. Um, there's been people who have speculated that James and John were actually cousins on Mary's side of Jesus. We, we don't have that hard and fast, but you will hear that, that thought um, come up time and again. Apparently, he was wealthy. Uh, we said this because he had, as we addressed, hired servants, Mark 1.20. He had several boats, and he had a home in Jerusalem. Not only did he have his home up in Capernaum, he had a home in Jerusalem. He also had access, if you remember this, this is a really unique thing about John, when Jesus is going through the trials before the Sanhedrin, uh, shortly before his crucifixion, that he had access to the high priest's home, which shows that he was a person who was known. And it was John that, when Jesus was on the cross, that Jesus entrusted the care of Mary to. Um, he, he committed Mary's care to John. According to the early church tradition, uh, it's testified that John outlived all of the other apostles. And after the death of Mary in Jerusalem, he moved to Asia Minor and, su and settled in Ephesus. Actually, according to some tradition, he brought Mary with him, and she died in Ephesus. Uh, with the Jewish war against Rome coming, they relocated to Ephesus, and that Mary herself died uh, in that region. We'll, some of those questions we'll have answered more definitively in eternity. And now um, he either went to Ephesus after Mary's death or brought her with him, and there is a traditional site of Mary's, um, where Mary would be buried in Asia Minor there at the city of Ephesus. Uh, while he was there, after he had some time in Ephesus, he was exiled to the island of Patmos and was later released and returned to Ephesus. Uh, these are from Eusebius, who quotes Polycarp, Papias, and Irenaeus. And so that's where he's writing from. He's writing this letter from Ephesus, the letters of John. Most people would hold the date to be in around 90 AD, or uh, pretty close to the time of the writing of the book of Revelation. There are some who view it in the late 60s. Um, Bob Deffenbaugh and some others think he wrote it pretty shortly after he moved to Ephesus um, as he was becoming more acquainted with the, the believers in that area. Uh, however, the more traditional view is going to be um, around AD 90. He writes in a very uncomplicated style of Koine Greek. It's the simplest Greek, uh, the least complicated of any New Testament writer, and yet his books, like no other, plumb the depths of of the profound and eternal truths of God in Jesus Christ. Uh, and that's what um, Bob Utley says. And if you, in fact, take Greek in Bible school or seminary or on your own, 
probably the first book they will have you do your practice translating in is 1 John because it's the simplest in terms of the style of grammar. And yet the, the truths it addresses are absolutely profound. Uh, this letter, 1 John, is not a personal letter. <clears throat> it's more of a memo from office headquarters. Uh, you could say a corporate letter. It has no traditional introduction, who has no clothing, closing or greeting, but rather it's a more generic teaching to the body of Christ. Uh, people has been highly attested in terms of people believing that it is indeed authentic. Clement of Rome, uh, who was very early and about 90 AD makes allusions to 1 John. Polycarp of Smyrna quotes John. Justin Martyr quotes John. Uh, their allusions to 1 John are made by Ignatius of Antioch, P Papias of Hierapolis, Irenaeus of Le Leon, um, and, and many more. And so its, it's place in the canon was, was never, never questioned. Now John is writing in this book because there are false teachers which are rising up and beginning to spread heretical doctrines. Uh, which we're going to call either proto-Gnosticism or incipient Gnosticism. Remember, we talked about this before. If you can can think all the way back to the earlier, um, the earlier letters when we did the, in the Church Age, that Gnosticism was a a marriage, an unholy marriage, between Greek philosophy and biblical truth, and altogether a corrupt byproduct, saying that the flesh was bad, and so you end up with a Jesus who never came in the flesh or a man who had the Christ spirit, but you end up with something that is, is not holding to biblical Christianity. And the Gnostics would hold to teaching secret knowledge. They would say the flesh is either evil, so you must abstain from any pleasure, or the flesh is evil and perishing, so it doesn't matter, so you can indulge in whatever you want because it doesn't matter. Both of those clearly aberrant um, heretical views, and they were denounced uh, by, by the Orthodox faith. Well, well, John is already having to wrestle a, as the last apostle with these false teachers trying to, to peddle their unholy wares. And so he, some of what he's writing in this book is going to be to combat that. Now, I did say a lot, next week we're going to be talking about contending for the faith, and this one we're, we want to be continuing in the faith. But all the books that we're talking about they go back and forth. They don't fit into neat categories. He is already contending for the faith, but as he is contending for the faith, it has a practicality in the book of 1 John to show how that should look in our lifestyle. So really, uh, 1 John, you could put in both, both the categories, but I think it's going to be a good bridge to next week. So um, as we look, John's letter is pointing out now the error of false teaching. And what he is saying, he's, he's offering reassurance to the believers who are trying to sort out what is truth, what is falsehood, how should I be living, to give them tests of fellowship. In other words, how do I know if I'm walking in fellowship with the Lord? How do I know if I'm living in a manner that pleases God, if it's consistent with his word um, and his character? Well, we do that. Um, I, I am married to my wife. We've been married many years now, uh, more than a decade, like, and in that period of time, we have we, we got married, you know, back in 2003. So do the math whenever you're watching this. In, in that scale of how long we've been married, will slide. We have married legally the whole time. We have been bonded together, and we love each other very much. But as you can tell in any relationship, how well we are getting along with each other will determine by our behavior one to another. And so as we are looking at tests of fellowship, uh, the Apostle John is not trying to make people question their salvation, but rather to say, how can you know if you're living in a manner that is beneficial to your faith? Are you living in a manner that represents God well, are you living in a manner that's consistent with a follower of Christ? Um, if I am acting untoward to my wife, if I am being um, inconsiderate, you can tell in our relationship will be affected. Our fellowship will decline. Not our marriage, our marriage is secure, but the, the benefits of that marriage, the positivity within that marriage can be affected if I am behaving improperly toward her or she is behaving improperly toward me. And we, in our, in our relationship with Christ, want to be living in fellowship. I'm going to say, are we fellowshipping, abiding in Christ? At the same time, there is that, there is that dual thing as you're, as you're also trying to sort out the false teachers to say, 
what are the characteristics of a true follower of Christ. And if these teachers do not have these characteristics, they may not belong to Christ at all, and they definitely should not be listened to. Because we want to follow teachers and Bible teachers that not only speak well, but also demonstrate by practice godliness, um, as is demonstrated in Scripture, who speak words that are consistent with prior revelation. Well, we see this in his book a lot. He uses the terms, if we say, and he who says, to point out the difference between truth. If we say, being truth, he who says, pointing out the falsehoods. Um, if we say, being that which we should model in our life, and he who says, indicating that which um, should be dismissed. So we're going to look at that here in, in this letter. And he does many contrasts between some subject matter, which we're going to look at now in this, in this next time together, which will be really fun, uh, between light and dark, truth and falsehood, life and death, the children of the God versus the children of the devil. And so what he does is he takes these, these contrasting worldviews, these contrasting behaviors, and shows them in contrast one with the other to point us the correct way to go. Well, let's go ahead and pray again, and we'll, we'll jump in to the rest of 1 John. Lord, thank you again that you can bring us to this book. I pray that you would speak clearly uh, to our hearts and to our minds and that we would be people who would have discernment and understanding and would demonstrate faithfulness in word and deed and in thought um, to you. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's go here. We are going to jump in. Test of fellowship. We already said this. Uh, but before we get to there, in the very beginning, John attests that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard we declare to you that you may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. You can see John is saying, Look, I am an eyewitness of the word of life of Jesus Christ. I have seen it with my eyes. I have touched Him with my hands. And I am a witness of Jesus Christ. My testimony is significant because I was there when these events which you have heard of I was involved with and saw firsthand and so he is writing it in terms of a validation of orthodoxy in this letter and in first John by the way we you will jump back and forth in the book because it, it right it doesn't go like a treatise it's not a theological paper um, but rather it's more like a homily or hymn. We have a chorus and then a verse and a chorus and then a verse, and you have the same subject matters coming back again in, in subsequent chapters. So it's, it's kind of hard to outline and put in a neat form, but we'll have the same themes coming again and again. Well, in terms of tests for righteous living, how do we know who is a true Christian and who is the false one? And once again, not to cause doubt on your own salvation or on the reader's salvation, but rather to recognize it in others. So we say, what is a genuine article and what is a forgery? What is the falsehood? It says, well, there should be righteous living. There should be righteous living if you are a sincere and faithful follower of Jesus Christ. And he's going to talk uh, at a point, says, if we say we have no sin, if we keep on sinning, and he's going to talk about that we need to live in a manner that is consistent with biblical teaching, with biblical exhortation. So also, we're also going to look at here that there is a love for the brethren. A Christian should be noted by the love that they have for other believers. And we see these verses in 1 John and other places, to love our neighbor as ourselves. By this all men will know that we are his disciples, what, if we have love for one another. From the Gospel of John. And if God is love and His Spirit is in us, how can we not love? And of course he talks about um, correct theology, saying that we need to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And even if you appear to be living righteously, and you appear to be loving, if 
our views on who Jesus is are aberrant, if they are false, then we are not from God. Now, it's the, the crucial, the pivotal, the crux of everything. What Jesus said at the great confession, who do men say that I am? And then, who do you say that I am? That is the point on which our faith rests, lives or dies, stands firm or falls off the edge. So, we have these tests of fellowship to make sure that um, who, who, is, who is the authentic article. Well, we read in, in, in chapter 2, verses 3 through 6. Now we know that by this we know that if we know him, if we keep his commandments, he who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself to walk just as he walked, righteous living. Our behavior should indicate whether we are a true follower of Christ or not. Love. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. I always want to break into song there. A lot of you may have learned that song in church or, or Bible camps. But just because it's been set to music does not diminish the truthfulness of that statement. That he who belongs to Christ should resemble the love, should, should show forth the love of Christ. And then, of course, beloved, test the spirits. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. So these are three of the tests, which we are now, and we're going to expand these a little bit, which we're going to look at a little bit more fully as we continue in the book of 1 John. We talked right away about righteous living that we should walk just as Jesus walked. And 1 John says, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. And this, this is the calling to believers, that we need to walk consistent with what we proclaim and what we've been told and what we've been called to. If we back up a little bit, we actually read in 1 John um, chapter 1, verse 5. This is a message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is a light, and in him is no darkness at all. Why should we be characterized by the light? Because God is light, and we are his followers. We are his witnesses. Uh, this is a concept that John uses a lot in his writings. You may remember back to the Gospel of John. In chapter 1, we read in verse 4, In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. And it goes on. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. That's John the Baptist, not John the writer of the gospel. This man came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not the light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. And so, so we see that this is not a new concept, obviously, as, as John develops it, which makes sense because this was a concept that Christ himself taught. And if we went to John chapter 3, when Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, he uses the same terms and imagery and truth about who God is. And if we would skip past you know, the, the marquee verse, John 3, 16, and go a little bit further in John 3, verse 19, we read, And this is a condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and that men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light, and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. And it's not, of course, just the New Testament. The, uh, like I said, this concept of light versus darkness. Psalm 119, verse 105 says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. 
in this dark world, this world bound by sin and confusion as a result of that sin, we can be groping about in the darkness and people who do not understand or have not recognized the truth of Jesus Christ may not know which way to go. And you know how it is to grope about in darkness. Maybe you played that game as a child. You blindfold someone, spin them around, and then let them stumble about the room to see if they could find the right path. We used to think this was a fun game as kids to be blindfolded and to try and find our way from one side of the house to the other. That may be fun as a diversion for a child, but when you don't know where you're going in your actual life, when you don't know what is right and what is wrong, it's a lot more serious. When you don't know if there is a God, who is God, or what is going to happen to your eternal soul, these are not things that you giggle about as you grope about blindly. But rather, the truth and, and, and our adherence to the truth, our, our life reflecting that truth, is a very serious concept. And what we see is that God's word is designed to give light. And as, as you would carry the lantern on a dark night to go down the path, to illuminate the path, to show you where the path is, that is what God's word does. It shows us reality. It shows us righteousness. It shows us the way that we should go. It speaks to the difference between good and between evil. It makes it clear. And when we look at the light of God, it should show us our shortcomings and even when we're doing right as we, as we hold our own lifestyle up to that revelation. Uh, have, you ever, have you ever bought a brand new pair of shoes, white shoes specifically, and you come home and you love the great new pair of shoes. I love getting new shoes. It's just, they smell nice. They're so comfortable. They haven't been broken in yet. And I'm talking about sneakers. I guess if you're having dress shoes, sometimes those are no fun to break in. It has nothing to do with First John. But you get this new pair of white sneakers. You put them on and then you put on your socks and all of a sudden you realize how dingy and dirty your socks were. You, re- you thought they were white until you got something that was truly white. And then you held them up and you said, I need to buy some new socks as well because now my socks look beige compared to my white shoes. Well, we need to bring our behavior into accordance with God's holy character. And a lot of times we could say, well, this is light. This is good. This is right. But when we hold ourselves up to the revelation of God through his word and his holy character being seen, we understand that we need, to, we need to change. We need to move towards him. We need to resemble him. And, and John says in, in, in verse 2, in verse 9, in chapter 2, in verse 9 of First John, that he who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. This is just one example that John, for John is giving in, in his letter here, First John, to show we need to be in accordance with God's holy character. If you say you're a follower of God, but you hate your brother, who do you see? Somebody who is also in Jesus Christ. Something is wrong. Something is very wrong. You cannot say you have love for God and be disobedient to God and hate the people that he loves. You cannot say that you have the Holy Spirit convicting you of sin if you have no conviction for the hatred towards your brother. He says, do you want to know if you're in fellowship with God? In this context, and he's using this imagery of light and darkness, how do you respond to your brother or sister in Christ? You know, many times, not just in this one example of a way this can be manifested, but we delude ourselves when we are acting incorrectly. We try and convince ourselves that our actions are are okay. But God is not only morally pure, and indeed he is, but he also reveals the true nature of things. He shows what is right, and he does not allow us to continue in our unknown error. And when we read his word, and when we are walking with God in the light, he's showing us the evil in our hearts in the dark corners. He is showing us the places that need yet to be brought into conformity. 
and we need to live and to walk in that light that what is inside of us may be brought into a proper relationship, into a proper action of a follower of Christ, that we may be living correctly. The Bible does bring illumination. Many sins, when people sin, they usually do it in secret. Many false teachings emphasize secrecy or hidden knowledge, but God's Word is available and brings light and illumination and is going to bring a clear contrast with the peddled falsehoods uh, that were being offered at this time. Now, with this, we see um, how does this affect sin and the believer? He, um, we, we've already, like I said, these are back and forth, and you're going to see all these subject matters, one contained within the other. But what about the believer in sin? If these are tests of fellowship, does that, does that mean we won't sin now that we have the light of God to show us sin? Uh, we have the Holy Spirit living in us. Will, will, will we not sin? What is, what is the relationship of the believer in sin? Well, first of all, the believer has to recognize that he is a sinner in order to understand the need for salvation at that point point that we came into salvation. We understand that Jesus Christ came and died for our sins and that it is in him that we find freedom from our sins, forgiveness from our sins and a relationship with God um, the Father and, and a hope in heaven. But after the fact, even after we have, we have salvation, what is this relationship with sin? Well, in order to have a healthy relationship with God, we need to be living correctly. Um, John writes in chapter 2, My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. See, because sin is bad. We know that, correct? We should not continue in sin. However, he, he says, if, if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And praise God for that. Because if we had to live lives of perfection, entire sanctification and holiness from the moment we came to faith until the moment we drew our last breath, we would all be hopeless. Because we read that he himself is a propitiation for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the whole world. So it says we should not sin, but if we sin, we, are, we understand where have our sins been dealt with. They've been dealt with on the cross in the person of Jesus Christ. And we need, as believers, to have a right understanding about sin. Sometimes as people belonging to Christ, we don't take seriously enough the call to live righteously. We don't take it ser seriously enough the way we view sin. And we don't take it to God. We don't do 1 John 1, 9 that says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and to purify us from all unrighteousness. But instead, we hold on to these sins and try to overcome them in our own strength and power without, without going to the Lord. Or we just hold on to this guilt. And the very guilt of what we are doing wrong keeps us from engaging in our relationship with God. We don't pray to him because we, we fear that he is mad at us. and Or we don't come to church fellowship because we don't know what other people might think. When what we should be doing is identifying the sin clearly as it, as it is seen in the light of Scripture and the illumination that the Holy Spirit brings and confessing them and claiming that they are indeed paid for on that cross and then ceasing to practice them. Um, now, the, John says here, as we, as we go through there, a believer will have sin. He will sin. But we're not to live in sin. I mean, that's not a contradiction. You will sin, but your lifestyle is not to be characterized by sin. And I put up this picture here on the screen because I think it's very much like a garden. Some of you in your life have, have grown a little personal garden. Some of you may have grown up on farms where this was your livelihood. But if you're ever going to do a garden, you have to prepare the soil and to, for it to produce good fruit, a good harvest. In order to do that, that takes a lot of work because if it's good soil, unless you're importing it and starting from scratch, something else is probably already growing in it. If you want to plant a garden, you don't pick a patch of dirt that nothing grows in. You want soil that can grow a good crop. The problem is our hearts are very much uh, a soil that can grow a crop. And sometimes when we come to Christ, they're full of all sorts of things that should not be there. And the Holy Spirit has its work and sometimes miraculously frees us from things right away. But as we plant the seeds to do good works in Christ, 
the fruit of the Spirit. From time to time, you'll see a weed grow up, something that had been there before, something that blows in and starts to grow. If you're going to have a healthy garden, you do not let the weeds gain a foothold. Rather, when the, when the weed sprouts up, what do you do? You're being vigilant. You learn how to identify the weed from the, the true plant, and you pull it out. And you know in order to keep a garden healthy, you need to remain on guard and alert against the weeds which could sprout up and the pests which would try to creep in from the edges and to protect it. And so in order to grow good fruit, in order to live in good fellowship, the believer should not be continuing in a lifestyle that is characterized by sin. If you have a garden and you told me you had a garden and I went to your house, I went to your backyard and you said, look what I'm growing in my garden and it's ragweed and dandelions, I'm going to question your garden. I'm not going to perceive that as a garden. I'm going to see it as a nest of weeds. We need, we need to pull the weeds out and not be characterized by sin. See, the sinful principle in our being remains. And we may have lapses in obedience. Lapses from holiness, occasional sins that do not speak of our overall character. But we um, need to continue the implication for John's writing here in these ver verses here in 1 John chapter 2, 1 through 2, by the Greek tenses and otherwise, is that we should not be continuing in sin. If there is a sin, that is something we need to deal with. But if we're continuing in sin, something is wrong. And we have to ask ourselves, what are we cultivating in our heart? What are you feeding? What are you nurturing? What are you pulling from the garden? And what are you allowing to grow deep? And what, what kind of fruit we produce, whether it is a good fruit, tomatoes, zucchini, pumpkins, carrots, squash, whatever you grow in your garden, or whether it is weeds, whether it's wheat, whether it is tares. It reveals either the error that we have internally as a believer, or perhaps even the sad truth that a person might be unregenerate. And... First John is, is counseling the followers of Christ, our lifestyle should reflect Jesus Christ by, shown by its fruit. But also the way to tell the difference between a good teacher and a bad teacher will be by their fruit. And, and we need to be aware. What does walking in the light look like? Um, it's not just tangible physical actions, uh, that kind of fruit. It's also the attitudes and the things that we want to embrace. Uh, chapter 2, verses 15 through 17 say, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but it is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. So, so we see there it does talk about the believer in sin. And then it talks also about truth and falsehood. And so, as we, as we look at truth and falsehood, uh, this is very realistic because there are now false teachers. And we, we read, and I've already read in chapter 4, uh, verse 3, that every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. So if false teachers were coming, guess what? They're here. They're here. And they may use my name, or they may use the name of Jesus, but they are not from Jesus. And we need to be, have discernment and the ability to tell the difference. Actions are one. But there are other things that they need, we need to be aware of. Stephen Cole from Flagstaff Christian Fellowship says, John wrote these three epistles late in, the near, in his life near the end of the first century. John had moved to Ephesus on the west coast of Asia Minor, which is modern Turkey. Perhaps Paul's warning to the Ephesian elders some 30 years before had come to pass. A number of false teachers had arisen in the churches of that area. John uses strong terms to describe these men, showing they were not true Christians who had merely different opinions on some minor matters. He calls them false prophets, antichrists, liars, deceivers. And that's in a, chapter 2, verse 18, 22, chapter 4, verse 3, and in 2 John as well. 
He repeatedly implies or states that they are not of God, but are from the devil, that they are from the world, and they do not know God. Their purpose was to deceive the Christians on important matters of doctrine and practice. John states, These things I have written to you concerning those who are trying to deceive you. They had at one time been in the church, but they had left to form their own churches based on their supposedly enlightened view of things. John writes, They went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out so that it would be shown that they are not of us. See, there are false teachers. That was true then. It's true now. We need to be aware, and we cannot give in to the, the prevailing social expectation of politeness. Well, that's what you believe, that's what I believe. We all have our say, but sometimes, often, when it comes to spiritual truth, we need to draw a line in the sand and say, this is truth and that is error. And if it's offensive, it's too bad. But we are people of the truth. We are people who will be faithful to God. There's a lot of liars. You ever get one of those emails saying, I am the uh, wealthy widow of a Nigerian prince. I just need a bank account to hide some money. I hope you didn't reply to that. There's a lot of scams out there, right? Um, you can get really jaded. Just recently, I had, had a phone call. My wife picked up saying that there is a bench warrant for my arrest because I had failed to appear for jury duty. Well, it was, it was spurious, of course. I called the police just to verify and said, um, the police department in town. Look, it's saying that I need to come down here to take care of things because I missed jury duty. Um, and I said, no, that's a scam. I said, I figured it was, but I wanted to keep Lori from, well, that's my wife, from having any anxiety, so I called anyways. And they were using the real name of the person from the local police department. But it was a falsehood. It wasn't true. I didn't miss jury duty. There was no bench warrant. They were trying to draw me in either for some sort of identity theft or some sort of financial gain to themselves. Either case, it was for my evil by their lie. And the same thing goes on spiritually. And John says we need to test the spirits to see if they come from God. It's, it's healthy to have a degree of skepticism. The Bible tells us not to lay hands on a new convert too quickly. But things need to be tested out and verified and vetted. Um, Pastor Cole continues, he says, It is not easy to spot an angel of light or a servant of righteousness in disguise. It's, that's why the New Testament abounds with warnings about false teachers. It's easy to be led astray. In his final words to the Ephesian elders, Paul predicted, I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and that from among your own selves men will arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after them. And Jesus himself warned that though some will come in his name that he did not know. The false teachers in John's time were denying that he came in the flesh. And we've already read about the, and, and spoke about the evil of the Gnostic heresy, saying that Jesus didn't come in the flesh. And John clearly refutes him in this letter. And he says, and we'll read this again, even though we've covered all this back and forth. In chapter 4, verse 1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. Well... Certainly there's other heresies than the Gnostic heresy that we'll deal with. But we need to have a biblical understanding of what Jesus said at the Great Confession. Who do you say that I am? So that we may have the response that he said, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for what he's revealed to you is not of flesh, but it's of God. And there are a lot of lies from the flesh, from the devil. We need to know the truth. There's a difference between the light and the dark. And its consequences are lasting. And in some cases will affect the eternity of people depending on what they believe. Well, we go a little bit further here and we have a few more minutes. One other thing that, that um, John talks about is the imperative of love. 
And he says one of one of the characteristics to tell if we are walking in fellowship, and one of the, the characteristics that should be a direct result of living in fellowship is love. Because God is love. And we read in, in chapter 4, And this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. Can you, can, and when we stop and think about that, we've talked about sins and how even as believers, we still have these, these noxious weeds that pour out of our heart and, and we, have to, we have to tend to. And even in our imperfection and certainly of who we were before, that God loved us before we ever thought of him. And certainly before we thought well of him. And he sent his son to die for us in our guilt, in our transgressions, and what we were. It was, his, it was love that held Jesus Christ to the cross. And he says, now as, as his people, we should be characterized by the love that he has. And how amazing is the love he has. If we jump back a little bit more, one of the, my favorite verses in the entire Bible, in chapter 3, verse 1. Behold what manner of love the Father has given, bestowed on us, that we should be called the children of God. It doesn't say, Behold what manner of love God has given us that he has pardoned you. Behold what manner of love the Father has given you that he puts up with you. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that he can call you his servant. But rather, behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. Those of us who are unworthy of in such a lofty status, such an exclusive relationship, so much beyond what we deserve because of God's love. We need to continue in love because it was John himself who wrote uh, later as he, as he was writing down the words of Christ to the church in Ephesus, perhaps before this, perhaps after, probably after. But he says, that he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven gold lampstands says, and this is Jesus to the church in Ephesus, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not. And you have found them liars, and you have persevered, and you have patience, and you have labored for my name's sake, and you have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you are fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. You now, certainly, this is a love for God um, being addressed here. This is our first love, our first, our heart's greatest affection. But love is important. He's, these people are doing all the other things we talked about tonight. They're living righteously. They're uprooting heresy. They're being vigilant against false teachers and they're continuing doing greater deeds now than they did at first but because there is not love god is about to remove his empowering presence from that church love is important and we are called to love we can't do a lot of things better than the world we can't but we can show god's heart if you go out into society you can find better musicians better speakers, better YouTube videos. Um, but what we can do is we can show God's heart of love, particularly for the unlovely, for that which is despised, for that which is cast off, for that which is not esteemed. We can love before we are loved in return because God loved. We can show grace. In, in John's last days, his strength failed and his voice was faulting. His command over and over was, love one another. We show our love for God by our love one to another. Um, it was attested in different sources. And if we are to be followers of Christ, that one of the fruit that we should see, if we to know if we are walking in correct fellowship, is how do we love he does also say that we need to make sure that we we continue in faith in chapter 5 everyone who believes that jesus is a christ is born of god um, right thinking right behavior 
and being aware of those who would teach otherwise. You know, it's uh, we do praise God of that verse which we read at the beginning and one of the ones you probably memorized as a child, talking about how God keeps us in relationship and we can continue to enjoy fellowship with him because of his own grace and mercy that he continues to show us, the forgiveness which he gives us, which we already read, but we'll read again. It says, uh, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We can walk in fellowship with God. He desires for us not just to be saved, but to walk correctly and to enjoy the relationship with him that we are created to have. And he not only saves us by his mighty power, but he keeps us by it. And let us pray that his mighty power might be shown through us, and we might truly walk in the light. Well, thanks for being here tonight. Next week we will be back and dealing with the subject of false teachers in greater depth as we go into 2 Peter and Jude, and then we'll also be covering 2 and 3 John. Well... I hope you have some more good continuing discussion and have a nice evening and we'll see you next week.